Hello and welcome tonight. Let's hear from the governor, counsel to end SARS protesters, insist Lagos State Governor Babajide Sonwolu and 12 others have questions to answer over the Lekki Tollgate shooting. Another policeman pays the ultimate price in the line of duty as arms wielding hoodlums kill police officer, part away his gun in Efron Delta State. The allegations are too grave to be swept under the carpet, insists the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, who is now ready to open investigations into the operations of Nigeria's security agencies. And we can still find a way around this as long as you are ready to address the sticky points. That's the message from the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson to the European Union ahead of Sunday's deadline for both parties to reach a post-Brexit deal. Plus we'll have business, sports and later on international news from our studios in London. On business news tonight, Nigeria's inflation rate seen higher at 14.8% in November, ahead of official reports from the National Bureau of Statistics next week. On sports news tonight, heavyweight champion Anthony Joshua and Bulgarian opponent Kubrat Pulev exchange heated words in today's weigh-in ahead of their world title fight. Busy days ahead for the Lagos State's Judicial Panel on the restitution of victims of SARS brutality and other matters. And that's because the lawyer to the end SARS protesters is asking the panel to grant his application to invite Lagos State Governor Babajide Sonwolu, the Minister of Works and Housing Babatunde Fashola and 11 others to testify before the panel. The lawyer Adeshino Ogunlano explains that the invitees could provide useful information concerning the Lekki shootings of October the 20th. The Lagos State Judicial Panel on the Restitution of Victims of SARS, Brutality and Other Matters continued its sitting on Friday with a counsel to the protesters asking the court to invite the governor of Lagos State, Babajide Sanwolu, and 12 others. Presenting his application before the panel, the lawyer, Adishino Gulano, believes the invitees could provide vital information in respect of the Lekki shootings of October the 20th or its aftermath. Mr. Adishino also requested that some clips of the CCTV footage of the Lekki Tollgate Plaza be viewed to ascertain if the camera was automatically or manually operated. But the managing director of the Lekki Concession Company, LCC, affirmed that the cameras were preset to work automatically. There are some instances of the shooting that the panic was for just seconds. In some other instances, of several minutes, from 17 minutes, 15 minutes, 17 minutes, 30 minutes. My question is, are you still insisting that this particular camera that produced this footage was not manned? That is, was not controlled manually by anybody? If we were in a normal situation, perhaps, Somebody will have noted, somebody will have escalated, and corrective measure will have been taken. Maybe it's also a way to also say here that this is what we are saying, that there, there, there are a lot of people around here to raise observations. Staying at a point for about 30 something or so, within our own system is an outlier. The head of the company says, I don't have security let me finish. However, there was a mild drama when Mr. Additional sought to know if the LCC has a private security, which he explains that the governor of Lagos State had confirmed in the video. But the council to the Lagos State government opposed the move to view the clip at the sitting. The panel chairman then weighed in by admitting the clip in evidence. Do you have a local security company working with your company? I don't have. You don't have? Yes. I put it to you, and I will have to be there. <coughs> but the governor of Lagos State said you have. It cannot be, because of having 
if they don't know it, that no, does not recognize. That is the rule. But if it is his own document, not document by a third party, then you can use it to impeach a general group. You have ever made this statement or authored this document, and the witness says no. At that stage, he must be confronted with that because it's supposed to be the only one that can handle it. Another round of cross-examination followed when the counsel to the NSAS protest victims drilled the LCC managing director. So, I'm not asking you because you don't work for them. It just happened that both of you, at the same time, light went off. Just happened by accident. My own life did not go off by accident. My own life did not go off by accident. From the point where there was nobody at that location, then it means that where there is a failure, where there is no light from the other source, the generator wouldn't be on. It was because there was power outage. Maybe it could be just one. No, don't tell me maybe. I wasn't there. In the case between Felix Lucky, who is a driver from River State, and the Nigeria police, which came up for mention for the first time at this sitting, the petitioner narrates how his brother Paul Lucky was allegedly killed by the police on October the 20th. After listening to the argument, the case was adjourned to January the 6th, 2021. On the 20th of October. I was in my house. So a friend of my phone called me saying, Mr. John, I shoot my brother this. So when my friend me called me to me, so I go outside to to close to the house place where they they shot my brother along the street. So before I go to the street there, I see every crowd everywhere. So that's why people begin to hold me. Or when they don't shoot your brother, where is my brother? They say, after John shoot and they drag and go to the police station. Before the day's proceedings came to a close, Respondent Counsel Additional Gulano asked the panel to grant him leave to invite a forensic expert to help his case, a request the chairman of the panel graciously granted. Prosecutors at the International Criminal Court in the Netherlands say they are set to launch an investigation into alleged crimes against humanity and war crimes committed by the Nigerian military. The preliminary determination call is coming in the wake of the security challenges in the country, especially in the Northeast. ICC's outgoing prosecutor, Fatou Ben Suda, insists there's reasonable basis to believe that members of the Nigerian security forces have committed acts constituting crimes against humanity and war crimes. Some of the accusations leveled against the military include murder, rape, torture, cruel treatment, unlawful imprisonment, and conscripting to enlist children under the age of 15, among others. He explains that the allegations are sufficiently grave to warrant investigation. As Nigeria continues to fight against insurgency, the Minister of Defense, Major General Bashir Magashi, reaffirms the commitment of the federal government to ensure the protection of all persons in the country. Speaking in Abuja at the decoration of newly promoted air officers, General Magashi advocates the need for them to bring to bear all the knowledge, wisdom and critical thinking that they've garnered over the years to foster a greater Nigeria. I must also at this point restate that the federal government under the able leadership of His Excellency President Muhammad Buhari has been forthcoming and remains committed to supporting the Nigerian military. The federal government is also poised to provide the services and indeed other security agencies with the required wherewithal 
in pursuance of their collective mandate of securing the nation. These are difficult times for our nation and the military. We must therefore continue to evolve new strategies to contain these challenges in order to ensure safety and security of our citizens. The government and people of Nigeria are expecting nothing short of professionalism from you as you discharge your constitutional duties. To the insurgency war in the Northeast, where the governor of Borono State, Babagana Zulum, says that the Sambisa Game Reserve, Madara Hills, and the shores of Lake Chad are still the danger zones for Boko Haram operations in the state. And to defeat Boko Haram, he again suggests that mercenaries will play a key role. He recommends more recruitment of soldiers into the Northeast operations, as well as a coalition of forces among Nigeria, Chad, and Niger. Governor Zulum was speaking earlier on our program, Politics Today. The only solution for us to defeat the insurgents is for them to take the war to the shores of the Lake Chad, mm. to the Mandara Hill, as well as to the Sambisa Game Reserve. We still have insurgents in the Sambisa Game Reserve. We still have the insurgents in the shores of the Lake Chad, as well as in the Mandara Hill. And therefore, all what we are trying to do are temporary solutions. The permanent solutions solution is that they should ensure that the remnants of the insurgents are cleared in these three territories. Yes, you are right uh, that the Nigerian Air Force has been doing a very great job in ensuring the elimination of the insurgents using their, uh, their helicopters and others. But you know, military operations have to be followed by some stabilization mechanisms. You have seen now, we have seen a lot of bombardment, but there is a need for the army to take over these places with a view to, uh, you know, getting some stability in the place. Military, military operations have to be followed by some stabilization mechanisms so that once an area has been bombarded, there is a need for and the Nigerian army to take over the territory completely so that the insurgents will not come back to such areas. Uh, these recommendations are very valid. For anybody who wants to say the right thing, we, there is a need for us to follow these six recommendations. One of such recommendations is for the Nigerian government to look into the possibility of, of a coalition with its neighbors, especially the Republic of Chad, to clear the shots of the, to, to, to defeat the insurgents in the shots of the Lake Chad, with the Cameroonians to defeat the insurgents in the Mandara Hill. And I think for now, we need mercenaries to clear the Sambisa to defeat the insurgents in the Zambisa game reserve. This is very important. Uh, have we lost hope on rescuing the Chibok girls who were kidnapped in 2014? Over 100 of them are still missing. In whatever I'm doing in my lifetime, I do used to be optimistic person. To the south-south, specifically in Delta State, where a mobile policeman was reportedly shot dead by hoodlums in a front area of Uwe council area of the state. The rifle of the policeman was also alleged to have been carted away by arms-wielding hoodlums. The incident occurred around 2.30 p.m. along the popular Chakwa Road in Wari, Delta State, and this has been confirmed by the state police command. No fewer than five policemen have been killed and their arms carted away in the last two months in Delta State. In part two, after the break, court grants former Attorney General and Minister of Justice Muhammad Adoke leave to travel abroad for medical treatment. That's in a moment. Please join us again. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channels Television, coming to you live from Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Council to end SARS protesters insists Lagos Governor Abadide Sonwolu and 12 others have questions to answer over the Leki Toll Gate shooting. Another policeman pays the ultimate price in the line of duty as arms wielding hoodlums kill police officer, cart away his gun in a full Delta State. 
The allegations are too grave to be swept under the carpet, insists the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, who is now ready to open investigations into the operations of Nigeria's security agencies. And we can still find a way around this as long as you're ready to address the sticky points. That's the message from British Prime Minister Boris Johnson to the European Union ahead of Sunday's deadline for both parties to reach a post-Brexit deal. The Federal High Court in Abuja has granted permission to former Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice Mohamed Adoke to travel for medical checkup at the United Arab Emirates, where he was in exile for about five years. Ruling on Mr. Adoke's application for permission to travel to the UAE, the trial judge, Justice Iyangikwa, also ordered the release of his passport. He's allowed to travel from December the 15th and return on or before January the 10th, 2021. Mr. Adoke had fled to the UAE shortly after leaving office in 2015. He returned to the country in 2019 and was immediately arrested by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. He has since been facing multiple charges, including money laundering, before various courts, which had ordered the seizure of his passport as bail condition. His trial has been scheduled to resume on January the 11th. And President Muhammad Buhari is in his hometown, Daura Katsina State, on a one-week private visit. While in Daura, the President is expected to carry out a number of private engagements and will participate virtually in the meeting of the Federal Executive Council on Wednesday. The President last visited his hometown in December 2019, having stayed away in Abuja, largely due to the global COVID-19 situation. The Edo State Governorship Election Petitions Tribunal has dismissed the petition filed by the Action Alliance and won Frank Onyaivi against Governor Godin Obaseki, the People's Democratic Party and the Independent National Electoral Commission. The tribunal ruled that in the petition against the first and second respondents, the petitioner, having failed to file the pre-hearing notice, is deemed to have abandoned the petition. Our correspondent Jessica Olobosere reports. The first ruling for the day is on the application seeking to dismiss the Action Alliance petition against Godwin Obasaki, the PDP and INEC on the ground of the petitioner's failure to comply with statutory requirements on filing of the pre-hearing notice. The tribunal's ruling delivered by Justice Suleiman Abubakar dismisses the petition. Although the counsel for the petitioner was absent when the case was called, he later arrives and speaks on their plans. We have a ground of appeal. We believe that even if the court was supposed to have taken the objection, the ruling should have been reserved until after the final determination of the petition. The petition ought to have been heard on the merit. The counsel for one of the respondents has a view of his own. Today we got one of the petitions dismissed. We are in the stage called the trial, you know, setting the stage for the proper hearing. So along the line, of course, we hope to be able to uh, defend the petitions and um, allow the mandates of the um, governor and his deputy as given to them by the uh, good people of Edo State, of course, to stand. A similar objection was previously heard in the petition. Our goal, Tracy Ebel, the candidate of the new Nigeria People's Party in the September 19 Edo governorship election filed against INEC, the PDP and Godwin Obasaki. This petition survives as the tribunal holds that the pre-hearing notice was filed within time in all the petitions. Uh, yes, the matter was fixed for ruling on um, the objection raised by the third respondent. Um, unfortunately for the third respondent, the objection was dismissed by the honorable court, by the honorable tribunal. The third ruling is also delivered, this time in the Allied People's Movement petition against INEC the PDP, Godwin Obasaki, and Philip Shaibu. Application to strike out the petition was based on the fact that the application we made was premature. And it was our position that it was not premature, it was timely. And the tribunal agreed that the application for issuance of pre-hearing notice was not premature, but timely, as it was made the first day of the seven days prescribed. Fresh applications were also heard in the remaining two petitions after which the chairman of the tribunal, Justice Yunusa Musa, 
adjourns to Monday for continuation of the pre-hearing session and hearing of motions. Jessica Oluguse, Channels Television News. Meanwhile, an Edo State High Court has declared as illegal the removal of Mr. Aremio Momo as chairman of Isako East Local Government Area of Delta Edo State. I beg your pardon. Mr. Momo was removed from office by Governor Gordon Obaseki over alleged corrupt practices in September 2019. But in his judgment, the trial judge declared the action of the governor as null and void and directed Mr. Momo to be reinstated immediately. The judge held that the state government failed to comply with the provisions of sections 20 and 21 of the Edo State Local Government Law 2000 in failing to consult with the Edo State House of Assembly before suspending Mr. Momo. The court also awarded the sum of 250,000 Naira as costs in favour of Mr. Momo. A day after the disappearance of the mace of the Ogun State Assembly, well, the mace has resurfaced in Lagos State, and it's all thanks to the Lagos State Police Command. The command said in a statement that the mace was recovered around Abuleado area of the state earlier today. Police operatives were said to have responded to an intelligence report from members of the community that someone in a moving vehicle threw out an object into the nearby bush and recovered the object, which was later identified to be the Ogun State House of Assembly mace. Burglars had invaded the office of the Ogun State House of Assembly on Thursday and stole the symbol of authority. The People's Democratic Party is matching action with words to engage the youths in leadership roles. The party's chieftains reiterated their stand at the National Youth Summit holding in Oka, Anambra State. It's the first in the series of programs lined up by the party in the six geopolitical zones of the country. The PDP national chairman, Uche Sekondos, told youths from the five southeast states that they should see themselves as stakeholders in the Nigerian project, while the party's vice presidential candidate in the last presidential election, Mr. Peter Obi, drew the attention of the youths to what he describes as the critical situation of the country which requires competent youth leadership. Power belongs to the youth. The energy is there already. And please don't go the negative way. You must be thinking, you must be innovative, you must think about what to do for your country. You must think about what to invent to improve the life of the people and the great employment for our people. It is the youth. This power is in the hands of the youth, not in the hands of the elders. And for PDP, our policy is very straight. Our policy is that all the state government controlled by PDP must develop a policy to include the youth and to create a, a space for them so that they can research, they can think about what to create so that they can create more employment for our people. In fact, for PDP, ours is to prepare you for leadership tomorrow. Your country is drifting, it's collapsing. And if you don't do anything, let me tell you, it will take its revenge on you. It will take its revenge on you. The World Bank released a report. Go and read that report. The World Bank report yesterday showed that this year alone, 11 million Nigerians will fall into poverty. 11 million is on top of 19 million that is already there. That means by the end of this year, Nigeria will have over 110 million people living in poverty. It is important for you to know that of these 11 million people falling into poverty, 8 million of them will be youth. When the news at 10 returns, Nigeria's inflation rate seen higher at 14.8% in November ahead of official reports from National Bureau of Statistics next week. That's on Business News. Welcome back to the News at 10. Legal luminary Chief Afeb Babalola 
has lent his voice to the recent controversy, trailing the refusal of the president to honor the invitation of the House of Representatives for a briefing on how his government is tackling insecurity in the country. Chief Afeb Babalola believes that the president should have honored the lawmakers, considering the obvious security crisis being experienced in the country. The reason why we are together is to say it is because we want your property and life to be secured. Today we have crisis over security. There is virtually no day you look at the papers you will find people were kidnapped, people were killed. It becomes the order of the day. I see from my below, it's not important anymore. If the parliament invited the president, I do not believe, I do not know whether it's, it's summoned him. I, think, I thought they would have invited him. If it's summoned, then give room for you. Diso if you disobey someone, then you can resort to uh, disobedience. With disobedience. But if it was my invitation, I believe he ought to have appeared by way of courtesy to those people. After all, the National Assembly is the legislative body of this country. The law, they made the law, they expect the president to carry out the law. I believe that if I were in this position, I would have gone. Fortunately, he wanted to go. He told the whole world that was going to appear. And it was, it was ill advised not to go. The Lagos State Governor Babajide Sanwolu and his wife Ibijoke have gone into self-isolation after one of the governor's close aides tested positive for COVID-19. The State Commissioner for Health, Professor Akia Bayomi, who broke the news today, said other members of the governor's team will undergo COVID-19 tests. According to him, they'll be tested by the Lagos State Biobank, but will remain in isolation until the results are available. He explains that the state is seeing a slight increase in the number of COVID-19 positive cases and wants Lagos residents to adhere to the advisories of social distancing, good hand and respiratory hygiene and avoidance of unnecessary gatherings. Foremost brewing company Nigerian Breweries PLC has completed an automated pet line for packaging non-alcoholic drinks at its Ijebode plant in Ogun State. The new pet line represents a 5.1 billion Naira investment with an installed capacity to produce 24,000 bottles per hour. The new facility was commissioned by the governor of Ogun State, Dakwa Biodun. Flanked by dignitaries as well as the chairman of Nigerian Breweries PLC, Chief Kola Jamodu, and top executives of the company, Governor Dakwa Biodun cuts the ribbon to officially launch Nigerian Breweries' ultra modern automated PET bottling line. A round of applause, please. Can I please ask that all. The tour of the PET bottling line offers guests a first hand understanding of the new facility designed with the latest technology that meets world-class safety and quality standards. During the speech-making ceremony, the chairman of Nigerian Breweries explains the reason for the multi-billionaire investment. We are making another investment with the commissioning of a multi-billionaire PET line, which will be utilized to further deepen availability of a non-alcoholic product. The chairman's explanation is further expantiated by the managing director and chief executive officer of the company. This new PET line will ultimately become a central supply and critical enabler to our plans to export our drinks outside Nigeria to West Africa and beyond. While commending Nigerian breweries for committing huge resources to the expansion of production lines in the factory, Governor Dakwa Biodo asked the company to continue to partner with his administration to enhance prosperity in the state. The location of this facility has come, has some significance. It is on a major road that links our state with Lagos State. On the East Corridor, the Jabu Ode Road. Though a federal road, our administration 
has decided to reconstruct this road as part of a deliberate, focused, and methodical implementation of our Building Our Future Together agenda. In one of the highlights of the ceremony, the governor performs the planting of an Acarian tree to serve as a memorial to the event. Over the past five years, we have invested 78 billion naira in expanding and continuing to upgrade our facilities. Incorporated in 1946, Nigerian Breweries PLC is a leading brewing company in Nigeria with 23 malt and beer brands within its portfolio. For the rest of the business news, here's Taniola Shobowali. Thanks a lot, Ijoma. Welcome to Business News. Nigeria's headline inflation is expected to increase further by 0.57% to 14.8% in November, up from 14.23% recorded in October. And that's according to latest forecast by Financial Derivatives Company. The latest projection would mark the 15th consecutive month rise if it matches the official inflation report expected to be released on Tuesday next week by the National Bureau of Statistics. Meanwhile, the economic think tank says the recent five naira reduction in the price of petrol by the federal government could slightly ease pressures on consumers' disposable income. River State's Governor Yen Somwike has signed the 448.6 billion naira 2021 appropriation bill into law barely one week, presenting the proposal to the State Assembly for consideration and approval. At a brief ceremony attended by lawmakers and state executives in Port Harcourt, Governor Wike commended the lawmakers for the speedy passage of the budget and affirmed that his administration will ensure judicial uh, implementation of the budget. The River State 2021 appropriation law tagged budget of recovery and consolidation has 68% uh, earmarked for capital expenditure and 31.8% to be spent on recurrent expenditures. Expenditure. Now, nearly 470 billion naira has been knocked off from the total value of the domestic stock market in the entire five trading sessions this week as extended profit taken on blue chip stocks amid increased volume of shares transaction. Obisi Adebayo has the details of Friday's activities at the NSC. Thank you for joining us on the Stock Market Report. There's a popular saying in the market that when Dangote Cement sneezes, the market feels it. That's exactly what played out today because what would have been a good performance was truncated by a massive 8.04% loss by the market heavyweight Dangote Cement, which single-handedly plunged the all-share index further down, this time by almost 1%. Not even the uptake we saw in the banking, insurance, oil and gas and consumer goods sectors were enough to save the day. But then we saw a higher volume of transactions today compared with yesterday's session, even though the number of deals recorded and the value were lower. Jai's Bank was the most traded stock by volume and value, as we can see here. And these were the gainers and the losers for the day. It's been a tough week at the market, but traders haven't lost hope yet as they maintain a positive outlook as we go into the new week. So investors have been asked to stay calm. And that's it on the Stock Market Reports. I am BC Adibayo. And that's business news tonight. It's back to you, Ijoma. Thanks a lot, Tenyola. Ghana's opposition NDC presidential candidate and former president John Mahama says he will not accept anything short of a declaration of the legitimate results. And this comes after the Electoral Commission declared incumbent president Nana Akufo Addo winner of the election with 51.59% of the total votes cast. Earlier, I spoke to Joy News TV correspondent Evans Mensa on what Mr. Mahama's next step is likely to be and whether there are fears of post-election violence in the country. Well, the truth is the concerns about violence has been there even before the elections. It's always been on a knife's edge. 
Um, thankfully, yesterday he did a press conference at which he says the party will use all legitimate means to have their concerns addressed. The, that means only one thing. That means going to court. We've seen this before in 2012, where the current incumbent president, um, and, and very interestingly, John Bahama was the president then. Uh, the current president felt aggrieved at the outcome of the 2012 elections, also called a press conference and indicated that he was going to court. He did challenge the outcome of the elections in court, and after eight months of proceedings, he lost. And now he's a president. John Mahama is on the other side. He also feels aggrieved at the outcome of the elections. Yesterday, he fell short of being categorical about uh, his, uh, his pursuit of legal action, but was clear that they will pursue all legitimate means to have their concerns addressed. And um, that could only mean the court action. All right, but the incumbent president, Nana Kufu Ado, seems a bit unfazed by all this, doesn't he? I mean, he appointed a 15-member transition team. Tell us more about that and just what you think his reaction will be, ultimately, whatever Mr. Mahama does. The president is mandated by law to set up a, a transition team that will oversee the transition, regardless of whether there's a new government coming in or not, the need to be a transition. The law makes that provision very clear. And so that is what we are seeing him do. Um, and I believe, just as we saw in 2013, when John Mahama was a president, whilst his legitimacy was being challenged in court, that the president will simply go on with the business of governing the country until the, the Supreme Court speaks finally. All right. Thank you so much, Evans Mensa, Joy News TV correspondent. Thanks for sharing that with us. Thank you very much. The president has sent his condolences to the family of Nigeria's outgoing ambassador to the United States, Justice Sylvanus Nsofo, over his passing. President Buhari, in a telephone conversation with the wife of the ambassador, described him as an outstanding judge of rare courage and truth who is not afraid to give justice to whom justice is due. He referred to the 2003 presidential election ruling during which Justice Nsofo delivered a minority judgment as a member of the election appeal panel. There's Simon Pusey now with more international stories in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. The leaders of the European Union have agreed on a more ambitious goal for cutting greenhouse gases, reducing them by 55% by 2030. The new target was reached after difficult all-night talks in Brussels. The EU Commission will draw up a detailed plan for all 27 member states to contribute to the 55% target, up 15% from the previous 40% goal. The EU move is part of a global effort to tackle climate change by cutting atmospheric pollution, especially carbon dioxide emissions. However, environmental campaign groups say the 55% target does not go far enough, while the European Parliament, yet to debate the new target, has called for a 60% cut. Meanwhile, the European Commission has warned EU member states that a post-Brexit trade deal is unlikely to be agreed with the UK by Sunday's deadline. Positions remain apart on fundamental issues. President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, said that no deal was the likeliest end to difficult talks. French President Emmanuel Macron added the EU would stand firm on key principles such as access to its common market and fishing quotas. We just can't seem to, uh, to make progress. And that's the on the other side of the English Channel, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson told the media there is a strong possibility of no deal unless the EU shifts its position. Time is running out to reach an agreement before the UK stops following EU trade rules on the 31st of December and both parties have agreed to end negotiations on Sunday, whatever the result. In the US, the first of five executions authorised by President Donald Trump in his final days has gone ahead. Death row inmate Brandon Bernard has been executed in Indiana after last-minute clemency pleas were rejected by the US Supreme Court. Bernard was convicted of murder in 1999 when he was a teenager and is the youngest offender to be executed by the federal government in nearly 70 years. Four more executions are planned before the end of Donald Trump's presidency. It is highly unusual for an exiting president to authorize executions in the last months of his term. 
A promising Australian candidate for a coronavirus vaccine has been abandoned after trial participants returned false HIV positive results. Australia had previously agreed to buy 51 million doses of the vaccine being developed by Australian firm CSL and the University of Queensland. But the government said orders of other vaccines would now fill the shortfall. CSL and University of Queensland stressed that the positive results were false, meaning trial participants' health were not at risk. The Australian government says it has now entered an agreement for the Novovax vaccine and upped its existing order for the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Aid agencies say four aid workers were killed last month during fighting in Ethiopia's Tigray region. The Danish Refugee Council reported the deaths of three security guards, while the International Rescue Committee said one of its staff members had been killed. Government forces have been battling the Tigray People's Liberation Front in the region. The government says it is in control of Tigray and the conflict is over. But TPLF leaders say they are still fighting on various fronts. Hong Kong pro-democracy media tycoon Jimmy Lai has been charged under the territory's controversial new national security law. Mr Lai is accused of conspiring with foreign forces to endanger national security and could face a lengthy jail term. He is the most high-profile person charged under the new law. Mr Lai founded the Apple Daily newspaper and has always been considered a fierce critic of the Chinese authorities. Beijing has said the new security law will return stability to the territory after a year of unrest, but critics say it has silenced dissent. And finally, a cafe in the German capital Berlin, shut down by the coronavirus lockdown, has found a way to recycle itself into a space for online art lovers. Und es entstehen neue Motive. Café Berio had served as an art gallery as well as a café before the pandemic and the closure imposed last month inspired the owner Anina Schork to open the empty premises to artists, including a live art window. The artists take it in turns and Miss Schork films them at work and streams the material where viewers can ask questions. The window and the subsequent streaming gives artists a way to raise their profile and sell their work hot off the canvas. And according to Ms. Shork, it offers the artist a new experience as well. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the channel studios in Lagos. Many thanks, Simon. Anthony Joshua has pointed in Kubrat Pulev's face during an exchange of words at the weigh-in for their world heavyweight title fight. Britain's WBA, IBF and WBO champion reacted to taunts from Pulev even before he tipped the scales at 240 pounds for Saturday's fight at the SSE Arena in Wembley. Meanwhile, the Ogre State government has rallied support for the Nigerian-born British boxer Anthony Joshua ahead of his huge heavyweight clash on Saturday. Boxing lovers and kinsmen of the heavyweight champion took to the streets of Shagamu to drum up support for their son. And the government says the fight will be shown live in five strategic locations around the state. FC Bayern Munich forward Robert Lewandowski has been named in the final three for the best FIFA men's player 2020. The Poland international joins Juventus striker Cristiano Ronaldo and FC Barcelona skipper Lionel Messi on the podium. That's a wrap on Sports News. It's back to you, John. Farrell Trinde and the main news again. Lawyer to end SARS protesters today asked the Judicial Panel on the Restitution of Victims of SARS Brutality and Other Matters to summon the Lagos State Governor, Babajide Sonwolu, the Minister of Works, Babatunde Fashola, and 11 others over the Lekki Toll Gate shooting video. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thanks a lot for staying with us. I'm Ijoma Onyato. Do you have a great weekend? We'll stay safe.